Good afternoon. Get ready for Addicted to Real Estate Radio. I'm Phil Falcone with my co-host, Jeremy Ricci and Larry Steinhaus, here on WWDB 860 AM every Thursday from 3 to 4 o'clock. If you want to ask us a question or you have a real estate need, give us a call at 267-988-2000. Who is addicted to real estate? We buy houses. We play Monopoly for a living. That's what I like to say. So if you've got a house and you're interested in talking to us about buying it, give us a call. We'd love to hear about it no matter where it is, no matter what kind of property it is. We're interested in everything. We also are the proprietors of Addicted to Real Estate Agency. We have three offices for real estate agents in Montgomeryville, Happer, and Huntington Valley. And what we try to focus on is investors. We take care of investors, our agents are investors, and the company is founded by investors. So you'll hear us talking a little bit about that today. Um, also, we have investor and realtor education meetings every month. Uh, the, our next one's coming up on March 16th, and it's going to be in Warminster at the Mike's York Street Bar and Grill in Warminster. And the topic of uh, this month's meeting is how to get rich, real estate investing with commercial real estate. And uh, I think if you come out and you, you'll listen to us talk about real estate, you'll see the passion. You'll see that we're truly addicted to real estate. So how's everybody doing today? I'm doing great, Phil. I actually uh, really missed the cruise. I want to go back on it. So let's sell some more real estate and let's get some more houses so I can live on the boat. Yeah, so Larry went on a real estate cruise. So I'd like to hear about that if we have a little bit of time today. It's, um, yeah. it's pretty neat when you can write off a trip because uh, you're talking real estate all day and you're Absolutely. Visiting islands in the meantime, which surely you were checking out real estate on the islands as well, right? Well, yeah, and actually, you know, you, you do realize that, you know, whenever we whenever we go anywhere, we can always write off every trip because what do we land on? <laughs> real estate. That's right. <laughs> it's always good to have some listing, go check out some listings, and you know. yeah, it's neat, and it's neat to, to to see what the prices are, uh, especially St. Thomas is one of my favorite islands. Did I you look it. at any real estate in St. Thomas? I, I looked at. I, I basically looked up and saw a building and said, "Oh, look, there's real estate." No, I actually wanted to. Um, I got. I, you know, my favorite thing to do in St. Thomas is snorkeling, so I ended up doing that. It took me a little longer than I normally would have, or I would have actually looked at a couple of houses that I didn't get a chance to look at. Sapphire Beach. Sapphire Beach is beautiful. Yeah, yeah. Love beautiful. It. Oh. So anyway, so you guys. Uh, so did you guys miss me last week, though? Um, were you, were you, you called in. Week? We didn't have to miss you. You, call, you <laughs> called in. <laughs> yeah, I got to go back. So why don't you tell us about our questions this week? What do we got? What do we got going on on today's show? Yeah, so we have questions. If you want, if you're listening to this show and you want to email in questions, send them to questions at addicted to real estate dot com. And there's three questions that we have. We're going to talk about. Is there a mathematical formula to make sure that you buy well? Besides buy low and sell high. It doesn't say anything about selling. It just says buy. <laughs> okay. we, we like to discourage that selling thing. Um, and what is what is it to stop our team, the Addicted Real Estate team, from keeping all the deals for ourselves? <laughs> and the last question That's a is... a very negative question. I don't really? Know. Yeah, because yeah, real estate is so limited, right? I mean, how many houses are in the greater Philadelphia area? Oh, I mean, don't answer the question yet. Too many. Right? Don't answer the question yet. Right. And, uh, <laughs> Make them wait. And how, how, how difficult is it to be a landlord? Oh, that's my favorite question. Yeah, that's a good question. So uh, today's main topic, we're going to talk about how to get rich investing in commercial real estate. And uh, commercial real estate, I think, is a great because it teaches you the fundamentals of numbers. And you can apply those numbers to residential real estate, so we'll talk about that. And uh, also, we'll, we'll talk about mistakes that investors make. So... I guess the important reason to talk about that is so you can learn how to avoid those mistakes, right? Well, so. uh, I'll tell you about my mistakes. I only make two of them a year, and I usually get them out of the way in the first week of January. So then the rest, <laughs> rest of the year, I'm good. That's basically what I do. Not, not buying enough real estate is a mistake, right? All right, so stick around. When we come back, we're going to go right into the questions and spend a few minutes talking about some of these wonderful questions. You're listening to Addicted to Real Estate Radio. We'll be right back. 
As a real estate agent, you know that most people buy a house once every seven years. Imagine working with clients that buy seven houses every year. At Addicted to Real Estate, they teach you how to work with investors because they are investors. Located in Montgomeryville, Hatboro, and Huntington Valley, work at an agency built for investors, buy investors, and finally learn how to invest yourself. Addicted to Real Estate Agency. Call them now, 215-321-SELL. 215-321-SELL. Hi, my name is Phil Falcone. I wrote a book called Addicted to Real Estate, Why I Can't Stop and Why You Should Start. And if you'd love to see an investment book written by a Philadelphian about investing in Philadelphia, I'm your man. You can check out my book at addictedtorealestate.com with the number two. I have a free web TV show there. I have free investment forms for real estate investors. And I have my book that you can check out, Addicted to Real Estate, Why I Can't Stop and Why You Should Start. And the website is addictedtorealestate with the number two dot com. Hi, I'm Larry Steiners, and I'm addicted to real estate. Have you been thinking about getting your real estate license? Well, have I got news for you. We are currently training new agents to be addicted to real estate. If you are tired of your day-to-day, paycheck-to-paycheck life, I will pay for your real estate school and your license. Become addicted to real estate on me. Hurry before we change our minds. Call me at 215-378-9190. That's 215-378-9190. Call now, 215-378-9190. I'm Phil Falcone from Executech Suites. Do you have a voicemail machine answering your business calls during the day? Oh, please tell me it's not true. I have an answering service for you that only costs $99 a month. We're real humans. That's right. We have live humans answering the phone in the name of your company and patching the calls to you for only $99 a month. And there are no contracts, so you can try it out anytime you like and cancel it whenever you like. Executech Suites, 215 942 I'm Phil Falcone from Executech Suites. I got a question for you. What do you get for $4.95 a month at Executech Suites? You get an office big enough for one person. You get the furniture in that office. You get the telephone on the desk. You get the telephone number. You get the fax number. You get the internet. You get two full time receptionists to answer the phone in the name of your company and patch the calls to you, whether you're in the office, in your car, or at home sleeping on a couch. You get the conference rooms, you get the mailboxes, you get the printer, the copy, the scanner, you get the janitorial service, the utilities, and free coffee. I know it's hard to believe that you could get all those things for $495 a month, but it's true. 67 Buck Road in Huntington Valley, Executech Suites. Give us a call, 215-942-7701, 215-942-7701. Welcome back to Addicted to Real Estate Radio. This is Larry Steinhaus. And Jeremy and Phil and I are going to discuss the next questions. So the questions are, is there a mathematical formula to make sure you buy well? What do you guys think? Well, it depends on what your exit strategy is, really. I mean, there's two things in real estate. There's price and there's terms, right? So if you were buying for to turn around and resale like they do on the uh, reality TV shows, all they do, they, you know, they interviewed Phil for a reality TV show, and it was too boring because we keep stuff. We don't re- turn around and resell it, so it's not <laughs> as sexy, right? So if you're buying just to turn around and resell, whether it's wholesaling or it's renovating and then reselling, the only r- real thing that you have to negotiate is price. So you have to buy at a, at a tremendous discount in order to build in profit for yourself. So there's a there's a formula. I learned it from a, a guy called uh, Ron Legrand, but there's a formula called the Mayo formula, maximum allowable offer. And that formula dictates that you buy stuff for $0.70 cents on the dollar minus repairs. So if it's a $100,000 house and it needs ten grand in work, you'd buy that house for 70000 minus the ten grand in repairs, so $60,000. And there's enough room. That 70% formula is um, comprised of several things, holding costs. It's comprised of cost of resale to list it with a real estate agent. Uh, the time it's going to sit vacant on the market, the utilities, all that stuff. So that number is not just a pluck from air number. Uh, I've actually seen it worked out and what all the costs are, but it's simplified into the Mayo maximum allowable offer formula. So that's one formula that, that a lot for, of investors use. that's for flips, use. right? That's for flips. Yeah, that's for flips. And sure. if you're a wholesaler and you're looking to just find deals and turn those deals over to deal hunters, you have to buy it for $0.70 cents on the dollar minus repairs minus what you want to make as a wholesale fee. So let's say you want to make five grand. You need to buy it for fifty-five thousand, so you can sell it to a rehabber for sixty thousand and make five grand. So that's if if um, 
people are looking for wholesale deals, price is the only, you know, you got to buy low, sell high. Now, if you are buying for long-term rental investment, which is what we mostly advocate, then terms are much more important than price. If you don't plan on reselling it, then, then you need to make sure that the payments are low enough that you can make great cash flow. And uh, I like to do owner financing deals where you, you can set the payments as low as the sellers are willing to accept. But you need to uh, – Phil always says every, every deal is treated like its own business. So it has to make money on its own and cash flow. So. Right. right, and I do the same thing. I, I treat each, each individual property as its, as its own business. Sure. Now, th- there was one thing that that, uh, that I also do is I look at um, – actually, if I'm showing – especially a newbie investor, you know, if I'm showing them a house that's most likely listed on the MLS or, or somebody has a price of the house, I, I'm going by the 1% rule. And the 1% rule is simply is the, the it's, if the rent is 1% of the purchase price of the house, it's probably worth looking at. And, I, you know, a lot of people say, oh, it's a good deal. I say, no, no, it's probably worth looking at. If you can't even do 1%, in other words, if the, if the house is $100,000 and the rent is $1,000 a month, it's probably worth looking at. But if the house is 100000 and the rent is 500 I don't even want to look at it. There's nothing even to discuss. There's no possible reason to buy it. There's, it's, all, it's pure speculation at that point, and you're losing probably somewhere between three and $400 a month in cash flow. Well, I think that's more likely in the upper end. Like, you know, most likely you could say, well, a fi- $400,000 house isn't going to bring you $4,000 a month. Correct. A $100,000 house, hopefully you can get more than 500 bucks. But I think as you get in the upper end homes, they don't rent for more just because, you know, a $300,000 house and a $400,000 house don't rent for proportionately, you know, more money, a third more, more money. Which is why I kind of stay away from the market. We talked about that a couple of weeks ago. I'm in the fifty to two hundred thousand dollar range, and it seems to work out well for me. Sure. Well, Phil, Phil, you know, you talk about this is the one uh, percent rule kind of weighs into cap rates, which we're going to talk about later. But that's you're really talking about a capitalization rate, where you're how how fast are you going to you put a hundred. Let's say you buy it cash, a hundred thousand dollars. How fast are you going to get your money back out of that deal? Or, or really, what is the interest rate you're going to get on your money? So if you were to take 100000 put it in a bank, and get 5% interest year after year after year, that's not bad at today's rates. Sure. But most of us are looking for a cap rate, you know, the, the actual rate of you know, probably 7 or 8%. I like, to, I like to hit it out of the ballpark. I'm looking to buy houses for fifty, sixty thousand 60000 and rent them for nine hundred to to $1,000 a month, which puts me in the 15 16% cap rate. And the one thing that you often find is that if you can get that ratio, if you can get a $50,000 house and have it rent for, let's say, 800 or $900 a month, they're typically in, in rougher neighborhoods. It, it's, it's, and this is true for cap rates, too. You're generally the nicer neighborhoods don't have as much profit in cash flow as a cap rate. And we'll, you know, we need to talk about cap rates later, so let's not get too much into sure, that. Sure, sure, sure. And, uh, but you're, the, the, the war zones especially, or even the, the rougher neighborhoods, typically gain more cash flow but at the cost of appreciation. So there's a there's a balancing there's a balance there between appreciation and cash flow. It tends to be that the places with less cash flow have more appreciation and the places with more appreciation have less cash flow. And this seems to be where you have to decide what your investment strategy is. My investment strategy is cash flow. I like cash flow. I like to, you know, you look, you know, I'm one of those people who didn't have a pension and I'm probably talking to 80, 80 to 90% of our audience does not have a pension which means that you need to figure out what you're going to do when you're 65, 70 years old and you want to retire uh, on a cruise or on an island like St. Thomas and where you're going to get your money from. And I'm going to get it from from my real estate, net, net, you know, my net profit of my real estate every month after month after month. Any formulas that you know of, Phil? I'm not big on formulas. I'm, I'm, I put a lot more uh, feeling into what I'm doing. There's a, I, I think there's a whole lot of other factors that come into play when you're trying to decide whether you're going to buy a property or not. And, and I think uh, more on terms of, is this a property that I'm going to want to own 20 years from now? Is this a property I'm going to be proud to own and I'm going to want to be able to rent it out to people that I care about? Uh, you know, obviously it has to make money, but to me that's, that's uh, you know, very simple math. I'm simply calculating what the house is going to cost me and what I can rent it out and what kind of repairs it's going to need in the future, and, and am I going to actually make any money off of this house? So, yeah, I'm interested in cash flow, but I think I tend to be more on the side of focusing on building equity through long-term holds. So right. I think That's with great. long-term holds, you're really talking about what can I rent it for, and then 
minus what are the taxes, what is the insurance, and then what's the cost of your money if you're using bank financing or if you're using private money, how much is that payment every month? And after you add up all those expenses, you, you figure out, you know, is there money to be made? Is there a difference between the, the, the rental income net and, you know, your all your operating expenses? Sure. And the, uh, the next question is, what is to stop your team, I guess that means us, from keeping all the deals for ourselves or for yourselves? <laughs> you already started answering it, Phil. Go ahead. <laughs> well, first of all, there is a world full of real estate deals. So if you feel that there's only five deals coming out of the Philadelphia area each week and we're going to buy them all for ourselves, it's true. We might buy a good deal that we come across before we tell one of our clients about it because we are real estate investors. However, I'd say that there is an endless supply of deals if you simply get your butt out there and start talking to people. This business is about being a lead generator. Okay, If you want to be a good real estate investor, you have to have the knowledge to know how to put a deal together, but what you really have to do is be a lead generator. You have to go out there and find people who are looking to sell their houses. It's no different than if you're going to be a real estate agent. You know what the first thing we teach our real estate agents to do is to become lead generators, to go out there and find people who are looking to buy and sell houses and then work with those people. Well, same thing when you're looking for real estate deals. Once you get your foot in the door where you found somebody who's actually willing to sell you a house, then you need the knowledge that we're going to share with you because you have to be able to quickly decide this is the circumstances that this particular house has and allow the house to dictate to you what it is that's going to be the highest and best use for this house and be able to see that and put the deal together. And that's the knowledge that we want to teach you at our real estate meetings. Speaking of our real estate meetings, I believe our next one is March 16th. And we're going to talk about how to get rich investing in real estate. It's in Warminster. And if you go to our website, Addicted to Real Estate, that's Addicted to Real Estate with the number two, put your name and email address in there. I will personally send you an invite to all of our meetings. Yeah, and also, you know, and, and I have to say it also, I, I hate to go to a, from, from your commercial to my commercial, but be, but become a real estate agent and get yourself on the MLS and see the deal before we see the deal, right? So if you want to become a real estate agent, you know, you've heard it in the commercial before, I will pay for your real estate license. Just call me, 215-378-9190. And obviously the catch to that is we want you to hang your license with us. So it's not a um, pay for the license and go somewhere else. We want you with us. So. And I think if you're interested in investing in real estate, if you're looking at getting your license, you'll find it immensely valuable to hang out in an office filled with real estate investors and where our goal is teaching the agents how to build wealth. Not just – it's great to work for money for income, but also building wealth by acquiring assets and have those assets pay you whether you, you know, are – before you wake up in the – you know, January 1st, when you wake up in the morning, you get a bunch of rent checks in your mailbox. That's a great thing. Absolutely, and it really is great. And that actually brings us to the next question, which is kind of cool. How difficult is it to be a landlord? <laughs> Everybody's looking. We're, we're, you have to, we all look, we're all looking at each other because we all have such great things to say about this because the reality is it really isn't that difficult. Well, every job has its own headaches. You know, It doesn't matter what you do. There's always headaches that come along with it. Um, you know, My dad has a, uh, had, a, had a pest control business for years, and obviously you know, there's issues with that. You know. You don't like being around the chemicals or customers not paying you or, you know, we have the same thing as a landlord. You know, you, you could have a customer not pay you. You have to file an eviction here and there. You have to mitigate those risks by selecting the right people, by buying nice houses that aren't, you know, Phil hates um, every once in a while I come across a deal that was built in like 1900 or something. And he hates those because there's a lot to go wrong with those houses. They're old. They're antiquated. You buy a house that was built in the 90s or 2000s, you're going to have a lot less go wrong with it. So it's a matter of selecting the right houses and then selecting the right people to be your tenants, people that are going to be a, um, an asset where it's not necessarily the houses. The houses are an asset, but surely the, the tenants are an asset too because those are the people that are going to work for you, essentially paying off your houses every, every month. Well, what I always say about uh, office buildings is um – you know, what I love about office buildings is everybody goes home at 5 o'clock. What I hate about apartment buildings is everybody goes home at 5 o'clock. And uh, what I mean by that is in the office arena, um, 
most of your problems and issues with your clients occurs during business hours. Because, and if you're managing it, if it's a big office building and you're going to be there, well, then you're already there to take care of those problems or somebody on staff is already there to take care of those problems. But in an apartment building, all of the problems and all the phone calls start coming at 5 o'clock when people go home and one guy's playing his music too loud and another lady is parked in someone else's parking spot. And, and these kind of problems tend to happen in the evening when most landlords would like to relax with their own family and have dinner and whatever you're going to do that evening. So there are differences to the kinds of – I think really the kinds of properties dictate the kinds of problems that you're going to have. So I prefer office buildings as one of my favorite kind of investments. The other one that I really like a lot is vacation rentals. Because vacation rentals, you get paid 100% of the money up front months before the people ever even arrive at the house. So take out one of the biggest headaches of the landlording business, which is collecting money off of people, and that goes completely away. So that is one of the reasons that I love the vacation rental business. If you'd like to check out some of the vacation rentals that we own – Visit GoSiesta.com, G-O-Siesta.com. We have a collection of beautiful properties in Sarasota, Florida, right next to Siesta Key Beach, number one rated beach in the United States. That's correct. You heard me correctly. Number one rated beach in the United States, better than Hawaii, better than California, and that's Siesta Key, Florida. You know, I, I want to chime in with, uh, you know, just for some of our newer investors. You know, look, being a landlord, it's really tenant management. And if you don't manage your tenants well, you're going to fail in this business. It's they really manage simple. you, right? If you don't train right. them, they, they don't train man- you. Absolutely. Yeah. You know, you'll hear the story after story after story. It took me six months to get rid of this guy. It didn't take you six months to get rid of it. It took you 45 days to get rid of the guy. You just did nothing for five months, and then you finally, you finally, you know, grew some and did something. That's the re- That's the reality. And, and, and here, what happens is if you manage your tenants from the day they move in, and I'm going to give you guys a line, write this line down. This is the greatest line for tenant management and lets you know that you're, lets you know, you let your tenants know you're serious. I hand the tenant the key after they sign the lease and I say, real simple, the rent's due on the first. After that, it's late. On the fifth, it's a hundred dollar late fee. On the fifteenth, I file for eviction. Now, let me make sure you understand this clearly. If you're in the hospital and you have pneumonia, I want you to call me. I will send you a get well card. But on the 15th, I'm filing for eviction. Do we understand each other? And let me tell you something. Right there, they know you're serious. And if you, if you, if you, <laughs> and if you're serious, you're serious. And on the 15th, you file for eviction. Believe me, they're not going to be rent, they're not going to be late often. I've taken only two tenants ever in, in my history of 20 something years of doing this to court. And both of them paid right in, right before the court date. Now, the other thing that people talk about is getting phone calls in the middle of the night. And really, you know, Phil will tell you that you're really just quarterbacking phone calls. Somebody calls you, it's a plumbing situation, you call the plumber. Yeah, exactly. And then you get them out there. And uh, sometimes I know some people that just give the tenants um, the phone numbers to their vendors and say, call these people because they trust their vendors enough to know that, you know, they're going to they're tell them whether or not, you know, somebody – Flush GI Joe figures down the toilet. Okay, well, build a tenant for that. You know, we get these uh, disposable wipes flush down the toilet that clog up the drains. I, I wish they didn't say flush or flushable wipes. Yeah, yeah. sure. Plumbers sure. love those things. Oh, yeah, they sure. get so much work out of those flushable yeah, sure. wipes. But anyway, it's just it's a matter of the quarterbacking those phone calls. So when we come back, we're going to talk about the main topic: how to get cash flow in commercial real estate. So tune in. Uh, come back with us, and we'll be right back. Hi, my name's Phil Falcone. I wrote a book called Addicted to Real Estate, Why I Can't Stop and Why You Should Start. And if you'd love to see an investment book written by a Philadelphian about investing in Philadelphia, I'm your man. You can check out my book at addictedtorealestate.com with the number two. I have a free web TV show there. I have free investment forms for real estate investors. And I have my book that you can check out, Addicted to Real Estate, Why I Can't Stop and Why You Should Start. And the website is Addicted to Real Estate with the number 2.com. As a real estate agent, you know that most people buy a house once every seven years. Imagine working with clients that buy seven houses every year. At Addicted to Real Estate, they teach you how to work with investors because they are investors. Located in Montgomeryville, Hatboro, and Huntington Valley, work at an agency built for investors, buy investors, and finally learn how to invest yourself. Addicted to Real Estate Agency. Call them now, 215-321-SELL. 215-321-SELL. 
I'm Phil Falcone from Executech Suites. Do you have a voicemail machine answering your business calls during the day? Oh, please tell me it's not true. I have an answering service for you that only costs $99 a month. We're real humans. That's right. We have live humans answering the phone in the name of your company and patching the calls to you for only $99 a month. And there are no contracts, so you can try it out anytime you like and cancel it whenever you like. Executech Suites, 215 942 Hi, I'm Larry Steinhaus, and I'm addicted to real estate. Are you a real estate investor? Do you know the value of having a real estate license? It's awesome. You get to make even more money and get exposed to deals you probably would have missed. Well, today is your lucky day. I will pay for your real estate license. Find out more by calling me at 215-378-9190. That's right. I will pay for your license. Call now, 215-378-9190. Addicted to real estate, bridging the gap between investors and realtors. 215-378-9190. I'm Phil Falcone from Executech Suites. I got a question for you. What do you get for four ninety five a month at Executech Suites? You get an office big enough for one person. You get the furniture in that office. You get the telephone on the desk. You get the telephone number. You get the fax number. You get the internet. You get two full time receptionists to answer the phone in the name of your company and patch the calls to you, whether you're in the office, in your car, or at home sleeping on a couch. You get the conference rooms, you get the mailboxes, you get the printer, the copy, the scanner, you get the janitorial service, the utilities, and free coffee. I know it's hard to believe that you could get all those things for $495 a month, but it's true. 67 Buck Road in Huntington Valley, Executech Suites. Give us a call, 215-942-7701, 215-942-7701. Welcome back to Addicted to Real Estate Radio. So we're back and we're going to talk about our main topic, which is how to invest in commercial real estate, how to get rich investing in commercial real estate. So... The, um, there's a lot of benefits of commercial real estate. I mean, Phil, you, you have uh, a lot more expertise than us. I bought a couple of retail stores early on in my career, but uh, nothing nearly as large as the, the executive suites that you have and, and you know some other commercial deals that we've done. Well, I guess the first thing I'd like to talk about is um, extreme cash flow. When, when I think of commercial real estate, I, I don't care how many units it is or if a bank defines it by being commercial real estate, which is typically five units or more a bank says it's commercial real estate. The bottom line is is that I want extreme cash flows. I want to be paid handsomely for owning a piece of real estate. And um, when, you know, when you buy a conventional residential piece of real estate, like maybe it's a duplex or something or, or just a single family home, you know, you're going to make two, three hundred bucks a month. And, and to me, that's just not good enough. I want to do better than that. I want to have extreme cash flow. So three businesses that I've always said have the best cash flows or what I call extreme cash flows. That's student rentals, uh, which work very good here, very well in Philadelphia. Uh, Executive suite centers, which is uh, basically an office suite center where we provide everything, the furniture, the receptionist, the telephones, the Internet. And uh, the third way I'd say is vacation rentals. Vacation rentals are often offer extreme cash flow where you're getting paid about the same price that people would pay for a hotel. So that's my first goal is that I want extreme cash flows. Now, uh, vacation rentals can be uh, single-family homes or duplexes, or or they could be commercial real estate that gives you extreme cash flow. And we definitely have some, some properties in Florida that I'd classify as commercial real estate by the fact of the uh, number of units that it has and the amount of money it makes. I'll just tell you a story about one of them. Uh, in uh, in 2006, I bought a building for uh, 2.1 million dollars, and uh, the story behind this deal was uh, it was listed by some commercial real estate brokers here in Philadelphia. And one of the things that happened was, uh, you know, I just ch- I just saw it on the internet. I uh, made an appointment to go see the property. I I. I checked it out, and I knew there was a property I wanted to buy. I I classified it as an extreme cash flow generator. And uh, I had one little problem was I only had about 10 grand in the bank, and the building was uh, for sale for 2.3 million. To make a long story short, I I got the building under contract for for $2,150,000. And if they had just asked me, these commercial realtors who were handling the deal, if they had just asked me, hey, Phil, you seem like a pretty interesting guy, and 
you know, we definitely would like you to be the buyer of this building, but uh, in order to buy a building of this size, you would need approximately $475,000 in cash. Please show us the money. Like the Jerry Maguire movie, show us the money. Well, they never asked that question. Never asked me that question. So when, let, let me explain to you what that really means. When they signed the agreement of sale, allowing me to be the buyer, I now have equitable title in this building. It took the property off the market for 90 days. That's what my agreement of sale said. Not asking me for the money and allowing, if I had no money in the bank and absolutely no way to buy this property, they could not sell that building to anyone else for the next three months. So they really did not do their sellers uh, any favors by doing that. Okay, you got to have talented realtors or agents involved in your transaction if you're going to have them listed. And then, so, if I had no money, well, how did I buy the property? Basically, what I had was I had a, a very large portfolio of Philadelphia row homes. Some of them I had been buying since 1989. So this was 2006. I... I already had 17 years under my belt with some of these properties. What I did is I went home and I put like uh, 10 properties up for sale. Like I called it the fire sale day. I just went home and listed 10 of my properties up for sale. And uh, I got lucky and I sold four of them within the 90 days. And actually on some of the uh, deals, I was even working both sides of the transaction. And... Each one of the four houses netted approximately $100,000 from the sale of the price. So that accounted for approximately 400000 that I needed for the sale, uh, needed to purchase this building I was buying. So I was still $75,000 short. Well, if you buy a duplex, for example, in the city of Philadelphia, whatever the security deposits are in the last month's rent, those, those figures get transferred over to you at the time you buy the building. Uh, so if you've ever bought a building, then uh, an investment property, you would, you'd be comfortable that you'd know that. Well, in this particular building, it had a $42,000 a month rent roll. And they had um, roughly about $60,000 in uh, last month's rent and the security deposits that were going to get transferred over to me at settlement. So if you added that to the four hundred grand that I had, I was only short fifteen grand, And I had about ten in the bank. So... Basically, I used $15,000 of my own money to buy a $2.1 million asset that had a $42,000 a month rent roll. And the profit from the building in those days was about twenty grand a month. So I like to tell people that I did put up fifteen grand of my own money, but I got a return on my investment in three weeks. That's a fantastic story. I mean, and, and you talk about the 1% rule. Wow, you, you blew that 1% rule out of the, out of the water. With uh, with uh, with rents like that, forty thousand on a on a two million dollar building. Wow. Well, I often tried to figure out why it is that uh, no one else was buying this building. It was actually sitting on the market for a little while, and and the only reason I can think of it is that the people who have the kind of money to buy a two point one million dollar building probably prefer passive investments more, like like triple net you know, uh, pep boys or something where somebody else pays the taxes and the insurance and does all the repairs and you just collect the rent. People who have a lot of liquid cash probably prefer those kind of investments. This was not that kind of investment. This was an extremely active investment with a capital A, meaning that the, in, the, the, the investor who buys it, in this case me, would have to do a lot of work there. This required a lot of uh, – this is a big building with 47 offices – it required a lot of work taking care of the property. It required a lot of sales to keep the property fully rented. You so, also had staff, too. I mean, you had a receptionist that's answering the phones in the name of all those businesses. You two had, of them. Yeah, two receptionists. So you have, you, you know, you're providing the coffee, you're providing the furniture. So it is a lot more hands-on. But with that, and so is the vacation rental business, but with that, you get the extra cash flow. So if you're willing to roll your sleeves up and get involved in the business, it translates to more cash flow. What I, what I uh, like to talk about, too, that I love about commercial real estate is deal-making. The deal-making end of commercial real estate can be a lot of fun. But when you're buying a house, um, if you try to present some creative offers, uh, you'll, you'll have success with it, but not as often as you'll have with commercial real estate because many people who own commercial real estate most likely bought it with some kind of creative financing, meaning that 
maybe the seller that they bought it from carried some paper, which means that they're intimately familiar with the process as well as the fact that you're probably going to need a little bit of help because it is a multi-million dollar purchase. So in many cases, uh, working creative angles on commercial real estate is, is extremely easy. And, and you're going to hear yes a lot more than you will on the residential side. So, I mean, one of the things I want to tell you about is if, if this sounds like something that's interesting to you, how would you like to have a building that has a rent roll of $42,000 a month? And how would you like to acquire such a rent roll with none of your own money? All right? It's, it's the kind of a deal that when you make that kind of a deal, months after you bought the building, you're walking up and down the hallways going, I can't believe these people sold me this building. I, I had the same question. I'm thinking, sir, why would they ever sell this building? At, why would he sell that cheap even? Okay, well, I'll tell you what they what they did. Actually, it wasn't that cheap if you consider uh, cap rates. It was actually a 12.5 cap. Now, if you see a 12.5 cap, you got to jump all over it. Yeah, but what year was this? This was in 2006. So in 2006, a 12, even that, I mean, 2006 was the height of the market. So to be selling a building, I would expect them to be selling it with a five or six cap rate, and people would be jumping all over it. Back in two, back in 2006, there were comparable buildings for sale with maybe seven and eight caps on them. Okay, not really the five or sixes that you see today. I mean, but it was the know. hands-on need for that building right. that really determined the cap rate. It's it's not just a passive investment at that point, and that, that was it. Well, I'll tell you what, I, th there's a couple different ways you can value real estate. I don't want to get into it on the radio, but at this meeting coming up next month on March 16th in Warminster, we're going to be discussing commercial real estate for a couple of hours, and I'm going to break down for you how the cap rate calculation works on this particular deal, how the gross rent multiplier works. So there's some several different ways that you can look at a piece of commercial real estate and evaluate it. But in the end, I'd say it all comes back to what we talked about at that first question, which is you're buying a business and how much is it going to cost you and how much money is it going to make? And, and it's simple. It's, to me, it's not very complicated. You don't need to buy a software program to figure all this out. And these kind of deals are out there. And I can tell you, like, I've owned this building in October. It'll be 10 years. And this building has rewarded me. The building itself, it's not a living thing. But sometimes I feel like it is because I love it. I love this building. I have uh, serious affections for this property. And it's been rewarding me making a smart decision to buy it and having the tenacity to try to get these people to sign an agreement of sale when I had $10,000 in the bank. <laughs> I thank those guys for uh, performing incompetently on that deal. Oh, geez. <laughs> um, and, and what happened is I get paid every single month. I get a nice big fat check. It depends on how the building's doing that month, how much I get. I get a nice big fat check from that property, which constantly reminds me I need to go out and find more of these things. Right? You know, I know the there's a different, quite a difference between single family houses and commercial real estate, but also having that diversity is good because the commercial real estate market operates in a different cycle, then it's not exactly, you know, if, if residential real estate's up, it doesn't mean commercial's up. But sometimes commercial's up when residential's not. So it's nice to have that, you know, diversity in your in the market cycles so that, you know, if you're not doing as well on the residential side, maybe you can up the rents on the commercial side. So that's what I've found. And, and I think, you know, for me, the vacancies last a little bit longer on commercial real estate, but when you get a good business that stays, they, they stay longer too. So... But you also have a lot of sectors in the commercial real estate business. You have you have your residential, which is apartment buildings. You have your office properties, which is obviously for businesses. You have your medical offices, which is really a wonderful uh, category to get into, a little more costly to get into. But uh, Retail? Retail yeah, and then you've got retail. So you've got all these different sectors, and they actually perform differently at different times. Now, when the economy is doing bad, retail usually gets hit pretty hard, but uh, vice versa, when the economy is doing well, retail gets tremendous numbers. But the so, medical, you know, the medical buildings—they're not, you know, there's not—they're not changing when the when the economy is down. I mean, people are still getting sick, right? People yes. are still getting operations or whatever they're doing. I mean, and they have a lot of one thing I, I like about the commercial too is these tenants will put in a, a bunch of um, uh, rental improvements, capital improvements to the property to fit it out for their needs. And the more they fix it up. 
the more vested they are in staying there. I mean, I have tenants that put twenty five grand into one of my properties as leasehold improvements, and do I think they're going to move out next year? Absolutely not. They had a lot of money invested in that thing. So that's a neat thing that I don't necessarily have residential tenants that do that. Maybe on the rent-to-owns where somebody will put on a deck on the back of a house or something like that. But typically our residential tenants aren't throwing huge amounts of money into capital improvements. And that those commercial improvements make your building better. Yeah, and your maintenance is different too. Um, I, I'm sure your your bill for snow plowing was killer at that at uh, on that building. But you don't have, well actually executives are a little bit different. But most people who have commercial buildings, you know, the, the, the cutout suite or the or the uh, commercial person I'm lending to, uh, I'm sorry, renting to is 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 responsible for all maintenance. So you're not you're not calling they're not calling yeah. you for clogged toilets. They're not calling you for lights that don't work. They're repairing all these things as part of their contract. Well, that's the opposite thing from what Phil was talking about, extreme cash flows, that some people like these triple net cash flows, or triple net properties, where the tenant is not only are they paying for the rent, they're paying for the taxes, and they're paying for the common area maintenance. So they're actually paying for redoing the roof. They're paying for all the things that, that and, and essentially the landlord is renting them the dirt, right? And the tenant's responsible for make, maintaining the building. Like you said, Larry. Now, in a situation with it, with the executive suites, executive tech suites, it's you know you have a bunch of tenants there, so no one tenant is paying for that. It's kind of it's kind of a, an association of. Tenants. But it can happen. I mean, I know a, I know a fellow executive suite owner who rented. Uh, she had a three floor building, and she rented an entire floor to one tenant, which she was probably thrilled to death with oh, at sure. the time he moved in. But at the time he moved out, that was a major problem for her. Major problem, and it probably took her a year to overcome that. It's all what you can negotiate too. I mean, you could actually, you let's say snow removal, for instance, like you gave the, Larry the example that you gave. I'm sure if Phil worked out a deal with his tenants and said each of you are responsible for one, some portion of the snow removal based on the square footage of your office, um, you could probably work that out. But I would say that some tenants like the idea of, of knowing that they have a fixed amount every month that they have to cover as part of their overhead for their office. It certainly makes it easier to sell office space. If people come in and you tell them, here's your number, it's five ninety five a month. What's it include? It includes everything. I t- it's actually easier to tell you what it doesn't include. Sure, right? sure. <laughs> because there's only like one or two things on that. Yeah. But it covers everything else. So it makes it very easy to sell. So well, do you even in- cover coffee? <clears throat> we do free coffee. <laughs> so if guys, guys, come out to our learn- meeting. Yeah, come out to our meeting coming up. It's um, March 16th. Yep. And uh, we're going to meet at Mike's York Street Bar and Grill, which is on the corner of York and Street, Mike's York Street in uh, Warminster. And we're going to talk more about commercial real estate. You can actually see the numbers on the screen, uh, which is a lot easier than talking about numbers on the radio show. So if you're interested in commercial real estate, come out to that meeting. And uh, coming up, we're going to talk about mistakes investors make. So stay tuned, and we'll be right back. As a real estate agent, you know that most people buy a house once every seven years. Imagine working with clients that buy seven houses every year. At Addicted to Real Estate, they teach you how to work with investors because they are investors. Located in Montgomeryville, Hatboro, and Huntington Valley, work at an agency built for investors, buy investors, and finally learn how to invest yourself. Addicted to Real Estate Agency. Call them now, 215-321-SELL. 215-321-SELL. Hi, my name is Phil Falcone. I wrote a book called Addicted to Real Estate, Why I Can't Stop and Why You Should Start. And if you'd love to see an investment book written by a Philadelphian about investing in Philadelphia, I'm your man. You can check out my book at addictedtorealestate.com with the number two. I have a free web TV show there. I have free investment forms for real estate investors. And I have my book that you can check out, Addicted to Real Estate, Why I Can't Stop and Why You Should Start. And the website is Addicted to Real Estate with the number two dot com. Hi, I'm Larry Steinus, and I'm addicted to real estate. Have you been thinking about getting your real estate license? Well, have I got news for you. We are currently training new agents to be addicted to real estate. If you are tired of your day-to-day, paycheck-to-paycheck life, I will pay for your real estate school and your license. Become addicted to real estate on me. Hurry before we change our minds. Call me at 215-378-9190. That's 215-378-9190. Call now, 215-378-9190. 
I'm Phil Falcone from Executech Suites. Do you have a voicemail machine answering your business calls during the day? Oh, please tell me it's not true. I have an answering service for you that only costs $99 a month. We're real humans. That's right. We have live humans answering the phone in the name of your company and patching the calls to you for only $99 a month. And there are no contracts, so you can try it out anytime you like and cancel it whenever you like. Executech Suites, 215-942-7701. I'm Phil Falcone from Executech Suites. I got a question for you. What do you get for $4.95 a month at Executech Suites? You get an office big enough for one person. You get the furniture in that office. You get the telephone on the desk. You get the telephone number. You get the fax number. You get the Internet. You get two full-time receptionists to answer the phone in the name of your company and patch the calls to you, whether you're in the office, in your car, or at home sleeping on a couch. You get the conference rooms. You get the mailboxes. You get the printer, the copy, the scanner. You get the janitorial service, the utilities, and free coffee. I know it's hard to believe that you could get all those things for $495 a month, but it's true. 67 Buck Road in Huntington Valley, Executech Suites. Give us a call, 215-942-7701. Welcome back to Addicted to Real Estate Radio. Okay, so now we're going to be discussing mistakes that investors make. And our expert, our local expert on mistakes is Larry Steinhaus. <laughs> Thanks, Phil. <laughs> so you guys probably don't even know, or I, I, I know Jeremy and Phil know, but the audience doesn't know that I actually wrote a book called uh, If I Won $25 Million in the Lottery, a book about money, hope, and happiness. And this was written right after literally a bankruptcy. I had 30-some-odd properties that were worth millions of dollars one day, and the next day it felt like they were worth Hundreds of thousands of dollars. Not like they were worth? <laughs> Hundreds of thousands of dollars. When they were worth millions of dollars the day before. Um, so, you know, obviously owed a lot of money on them. And I made a, a uh, business decision, uh, not unlike Donald Trump, to let those businesses go. <laughs> so here's the mistakes that I made. And, and honestly, I've been doing this for a long time. And it was only two years that I changed. It was for two years that I changed the way I did business. And that was the biggest mistake I made. And the first mistake you're going to make is getting greedy. Do not get greedy. If you get greedy in this business or in any business, you're going to make major mistakes. And, and you know, what was happening was I had, I had clear goals and clear cash flow goals where every property that I bought in the past had to make at least $200 a month, um, had to be easy to get rid of, and I had to also have no more than, uh, you, have, you know, no more than an 80% loan on the property. So that in a fire sale, I could get rid of it. Well, you know, 2006 comes along, and we all remember 2006. I financed properties at 125%, 135%, got money back at closings, all kinds of things that really are bad business decisions, but frankly were a lot of fun to do. <laughs> and the cash flow didn't support the loans? Is that the what you're ca- saying? The cash flow didn't support the loans. Hmm. What, year? You know, uh, what year was this? Six, seven, and eight. Yeah, that, and then eight was just the end of it. Uh, you know, and I, and I ha- unfortunately I had to let the properties go, and 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 that was unfortunate. But you know, you know what's really neat, and, and I just want to—I know we're going to talk about mistakes, but I, w- I want to say one thing that you know, in this business, if you persevere, you're back on top, and I'm back on top. I'm actually now I'm back to the normal way that I usually do business. I have I have lots of properties. I'm making my cash flow, and I bounce back. And you got to remember that that's in, my bankruptcy shows up in 2009, and it's 2016, seven years later. I'm back on top. Do I have trouble getting mortgages? Not, not anymore. I did the first two, three years. Um, actually, we probably should do one day, we should do a seminar on how to rebuild your credit because I'm an expert on that. <laughs> but but the big, but that's a big mistake is getting greedy. The other mistake you make is listening to people giving advice. And I didn't make this mistake. I've never made this mistake. But give, giving advice who really have no idea what they're talking about. Oh yeah, I used to be a landlord once, and and uh, and uh, you know, and, and I'll tell you what you should do: you should lock out your tenants. No, that's a really big mistake. So listen to people who know what they're talking about. Come to our seminars. Call us. Honestly, you can call you can call Phil, you can call myself, and we'll be more than happy to give you some advice. Um, you know, not legal advice and not accounting advice. That's our disclaimer, right, Jeremy? Yeah. That we're not accountants and we're not lawyers. But we can give you some practical experience advice on how to handle tenants and when they when and when they do things wrong. Don't make mistakes with tenants because when you make mistakes with tenants, 
you're gonna you go to they go to you go to court and you're gonna have a tougher time getting rid of them. But it, you're also dealing with real estate agents if you're buying houses through a real estate agent. Deal with agents, you know, in our office who actually understand investing. Absolutely. So if you're gonna buy investment property, wouldn't it be great to buy it from somebody who is an investor and understands the numbers? And uh, obviously come out to our meetings with the commercial real estate to learn about that. But those numbers in commercial also translate to residential too. Yeah, I so. love it when I'm looking at when I'm looking at some of the MLS descriptions. And the first thing that the unexperienced real estate agent writes: This is a great investment. First of all, there's not even there, there's nothing there's no money in the deal. There's no you know, even if you rented it, you know, one percent rule. Be, you know, be lucky if there was a point one percent rule on some of these some of these. But the big thing that they're trying to say is it's a speculative investment. All the houses in the areas are going for a hundred thousand, so this one's selling for a hundred thousand, and we think that in a few years they'll be selling for two hundred thousand. That's a major mistake too. Never buy houses on speculation. Sure, I was going to mention that. That speculation is really one of the reasons that a lot of people got caught up back in the crash was that they were buying houses that they were hoping would go up in value, and they did not. And that was right. really the whole the mindset, like, oh, real estate will never lose. You know, you, you, you guys saw that movie, The uh, the Big uh, big Short? The Big Short, yeah, sure. Yeah, that was a great movie. And basically, the, the premise of that was that everybody thought it was all everything was great, and it was always going to go up. But one of the things that I – tell people to avoid is only having one exit strategy too. So a lot of the friends that I have that got clobbered when the real estate market went down were people that were buying flips. And the only if they were buying higher end flips especially, the only exit strategy they had was to resell it. Having that backup strategy, like right. I like the buy first time home buyer type houses. There's a lot of turnover in that market. Even if the interest rates are high, people are still looking to buy their first house. But the other thing is if the house doesn't sell a first-time home buyer house, you can typically rent it and cover your monthly uh, expenses, cover your mortgage payment, cover the um, the taxes and the insurance and all that stuff. So having multiple exit strategies, I think, is a great way to mitigate loss. Yeah, and that's and that's what I had mentioned before. Where I where everything now, I, I won't take more than eighty percent loan. In fact, I don't even like eighty percent loans. I like to go fifty, sixty, or seventy, just so I really can get out if I need to. On top of that, I'm looking to make sure that the rent more than covers all my expenses. And and also, you know, sometimes you know you're buying property subject to, which makes it even easier to protect to protect yourself and and not make mistakes. I know we, I, we don't have time to go into subject to now, but but we will. We I know we're going to do that in a future radio show. Yes, one of the thing I have a, I had a um, a mentor that said that uh, there's two ways to get to there's two ways to make mistakes in real estate: signing your name on dotted lines, and you know paying too much for it, right? <laughs> So you, if you sign your name on a dotted line, you give personal guarantees on the real estate uh, through traditional lending, then you're you're risking it all. You know, if you treat each separate deal as a separate business and you limit your recourse to ju limit the recourse just to that particular deal, a lender is not going to lend you as much money. But that actually is a protection mechanism. If you have a private lender or a hard money lender, they're going to lend you an amount that's appropriate. When these big box banks lent money, they, they did it on speculation too, hoping the property was going to go up in value. And uh, I know people that bought at the Jersey Shore, and they were saying, yeah, it's going to lose money every month, but these things just keep going up. And I, I'm fortunate. I, I, thankfully, I never did that. I never invested in that. I remember when I first got into the business, a real estate agent took me around looking at properties, and he said, you're going to lose money for the first several years, but don't worry. It'll break even eventually, and then it, you'll make money sooner than later. You know, and, and that was just bad advice, I thought. You know, yeah, I need to, I need to make yeah. I need to make money going into it. I need to know day one that it's going to make money because if it's losing money, how many of those can you afford, right? How many lo properties losing money can you can you afford? And, and, and maybe you can afford a few of them, but um, but certainly if you if all of them are making money individually on their own and they stand alone, then you can afford as many as you can manage, right? Yeah, and that's and that's really the difference between you know you're talking about a real estate you know the real estate agents in, in our office versus the real estate office uh, agents in other offices and I shouldn't say all but most because most most real estate agents are selling you know the McMansion mom and pop houses where our people concentrate on working with investors and we learn how to work with investors. In fact, you know I, I've said it before if you want if you are if you're an investor you really should get your real estate license. Come see me, I will absolutely pay for your real estate license if you want to work with us. My phone number again, 215-378-9190. So there's some other things that people make mistake is they're also, they're also, you know, they have one deal. 
They spoke to their neighbor's friend's brother's best friend's uncle who has a house that they want to sell, and it's probably it may or may not be a good deal, but 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 t- and typically it's not. And then they say, oh well, you know, I'm trying to buy this deal. It's a hundred thousand. The houses in the area are going for one twenty, and I'm trying to figure out how to buy it. Well, you know, if 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 it's your only deal and you have nothing else you're working with, then it sounds like a really good deal to you. I mean, you know, Phil and Phil and I and Jeremy, the, the, you know, we're all sitting here, and you know, our phone rings constantly. I mean, I'm on my cruise, and my phone rang four times about people who wanted to sell houses, and we can't buy them all. But the reality is, because we have our phone ringing so often, that we're going to get more deals to work with and more deals to filter through. And look, and one of the ways to do it is, you know, having a lead capture website. And I've said this before. You know, we have a lead capture website that's available to you guys. If you go to easyoutrealestate.com slash addicted, you'll see one of the one of the websites. And if you want your own, for 50 bucks, we'll create one by just hitting the button at the bottom that says start here. So yeah. Let me ask a question about what we were talking about earlier. Um, isn't there? Isn't it true that there's a mechanism now in place that even if you were to sign a, a mortgage, say, with Wells Fargo, for example, you're signing for it personally, isn't there a mechanism in place now in the state of Pennsylvania that keeps the bank from coming after other assets? Yeah, I don't know that. When you're signing personally, a lot of times there's personal recourse. So when you're when you're signing... Your name on the dotted line. You're not. It's not the sole collateral. You're actually that personal signature. Okay. Well, what about all these people who lost their homes in this foreclosure wave that happened over the last five and six years? There, there was a law that was passed to prevent banks from uh, going after deficiency judgments, but that that's actually expired. So that was that went into play when there's so many mortgage defaults and uh, people were. Upside down. Okay. And there were short sales going on. There was a law that that was put in place to you know prevent them from going after these deficiencies personally. But so where uh, where I'm going with this thing is, I'd have to say that I think signing your name on the dotted line could be the way to make the biggest mistake of your oh, life. Oh, I agree. Right. So <clears throat> if you could get anything out of this mistake section right now, it would be that you're not going to do that. And if you want, you're going to probably say to yourself, "Well, how am I going to buy houses if I?" Can't sign my name. I said, well, you better come to one of our meetings, and we're going to teach you how. So if you're interested in being a sponsor or a guest on this show, give me a call at 267-988-2000. I'd love to talk to you about your business and if it relates to our uh, clientele, and maybe we can help each other out. And don't forget to come to our next meeting. It's at March 16th in Warminster at Mike's York Street Bar and Grill. Go to addictedtorealestate.com. Put your name and email address in there to get sent an invitation to our next meeting. And if you're listening to this radio show now and you want to hear it live or, or you're, if you're listening on a podcast or if you happen to be driving your car, we're on the radio every Thursday at 3 o'clock on WWDB. That's uh, 8.60 a.m. in the Philadelphia area where you can listen to it. Phil actually puts out uh, YouTube videos on the YouTube channel, which you can, if you put your name and email address in addicted to real com, put your name and email address, you'll get a email with a link to segments of the show so you can listen to them down the road and, and get some notifications because most likely you'll forget to tune in Thursdays at 3. And, of course, if you're an investor and you want to get your real estate license or if you need some help finding properties, give me a call, Larry Steinhouse, 215-378-9190, and I'll pay for your real estate license. Thanks for tuning in, everybody. We'll talk to you next week. Good afternoon. Get ready for Addicted to Real Estate Radio. I'm Phil Falcone with my co-host, Jeremy Ricci and Larry Steinhouse, here on WWDB 860 AM every Thursday from 3 to 4 o'clock. If you want to ask us a question or you have a real estate need, Give us a call at 267-988-2000. Who is addicted to real estate? We buy houses. We play Monopoly for a living. That's what I like to say. So if you've got a house and you're interested in talking to us about buying it, give us a call. We'd love to hear about it no matter where it is, no matter what kind of property it is. We're interested in everything. We also are the proprietors of Addicted to Real Estate Agency. We have three.